So Jackson Hinkle, very big supporter of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also notably a big supporter of the Chinese and their claims over Taiwan. I've debated him on this before. It did not go well for him. It seemed like he had a very surface level understanding of both the war in, uh, you know, the, 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 the war in Syria, which we discussed uh, during the end. It seemed like he only really knew about the chemical attacks and not really anything about basic Syrian history. And even what he knew about the chemical attacks mostly just seemed to be from alt media kind of, uh, you know, not really super reputable sources. And from his discussion on Taiwan, it just seemed like he had no interest in discussing the facts of the matter. He just, you know, we don't have an embassy there. And then I would say, well, we do have basically an embassy. We have we have a building that acts as an embassy in every way, but we call it a private institute. How is that functionally different from an embassy? And from that, the moment I said that, he would do everything possible to stop me from talking. And even if you go into the replies of the debate on his channel, most of the comments are like advice on how to be better at debating, which is usually not a good sign. So Vivek Goswami, though, disagrees with Jackson Hinkle on the issue of China. Vivek Goswami is a China hawk. See, the whole point of Vivek Goswami's uh, like Ukraine pitch is that he wants to sell out Ukraine, give up Ukraine, let the Russians take it, do whatever they want with Ukraine, uh, in order for us to win them over, to turn them against the Chinese. Now, he's trying to compare it to, you know, Richard Nixon's, like, reach out to China, uh, you know, the reopening of relations that capitalized on the Sino-Soviet split, the split between the Chinese and the Soviets that led to troop increases on the border. Um, a lot of it came from destalinization, but I don't want to get into the politics of why the Sino-Soviet split happened. But the Chinese and the Soviets were beefing, and Nixon wanted to take advantage of it for both economic reasons and geopolitical reasons so he could get, you know, spy stations on the Chinese border with Russia. He then worked with China to smuggle weapons through the Mujahideen using Chinese donkeys going through the mountain ranges, using Chinese donkeys to go through the mountain ranges because the Soviets controlled the major road lines in, in Afghanistan. The problem is, is there's no equivalent Sino-Soviet split. And we'd probably have to give the Russians a lot more than just Ukraine for them to switch on one of their main crude consumers right now. Not to mention, how is this going to affect the Europeans who concern, you know, control 20% of the world's reserve currency in the euro, that's second after the dollar, if we want them to engage in any of the economic warfare that Vivek Goswami would undoubtedly want the Europeans to participate in against China and any crisis, how are you going to get them to agree to that if you don't even care about their security interests in Europe? I don't think he's really thought through the plan. Why, why would we give Russia Ukraine and then they split with China and work with us against them? What, 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 where, how does that follow? It doesn't follow. It doesn't really make any sense. But that's not really what Jackson Hinkle went after him for. Jackson Hinkle went after him for just at one time calling Vladimir Putin a bully. Listen to this. Vivek Walshwami said, Putin is a bully. The way to stop a bully is to punch him in the nose. But you can't do that when you're dependent on the bully for, say, natural gas. Now, a lot has changed since he made this tweet. A lot of people call Vivek Walshwami a flip-flopper, and I think they're right. He changes his positions quite a lot very recently in the last two years. For example, he wrote a book shortly after January 6th where he called it a travesty and like a terrible moment for a country, which he has completely flipped on what he says in that book and the mentality that he has. He's flipped on the mentality that he expresses here. I mean, he hasn't only voted until the last two elections. So it seems like politics is, is something he's kind of just getting into. So it's not... That's surprising that he's just kind of dipping his toes in every topic, but he's a good fast talker, like a used car salesman. So he's gotten pretty far. Anyway, Jackson Hinkle isn't happy about this post that Vivek Walshwami made. That is, I think, I don't know, pretty milk toast in my opinion. He says, Vivek Walshwami claims Putin is a bully who needs to be punched in the nose. He is a deep state hack who wants to attack Putin and go to war with China rather than building a more peaceful world. So because Vivek Walshwami merely acknowledged the fact that Putin, who has kidnapped over 19,000 Ukrainian children illegally and abducted them, 
whose soldiers have engaged in some of the worst atrocities we've seen in Europe since the Yugoslav genocide. And we actually seen the largest mass grave in Europe produced in Izium, over 440 bodies since the Yugoslav genocides. We had the extrajudicial killings, rape as a weapon of war, beheadings, castrations of Ukrainian soldiers. Oh, calling him a bully is too tough language. If you, if you insult Putin in any way, you're a deep state hack. Jackson Hinkle's whole brain is just dumb partisanship. It's just dumb, dumb, dumb partisanship and contrarianism. This isn't where the story ends, though, because I wouldn't really comment on this if this is all it was. It's just like, oh, you know, you know what this reminds me of? I, I posted a picture of it. It reminds me of like the two monkeys fighting with knives. I would just kind of like watch it from a distance. It's like, oh, OK, this is fun to watch. You know, no matter who loses, I win. I don't like either of these guys, really. But it didn't end there because apparently they clashed in a Twitter space. Now, this is an edited down version of that interaction, I believe, but they clashed on the issue of China. This is posted by Jackson Hinkle, saying Vivek Goswami is a neocon who agrees 100% with George Soros on taking the US to war with China over Taiwan by nuking the one China policy. Trump values diplomacy with, Ta with China. Vivek wants war. So it just seems mostly that Jackson Hinkle's attacks on Vivek Walshwami, and I'm not a fan of Vivek Walshwami, I don't like him. It seems to mostly just be like, like attacks on association. Like it's not, here's why Vivek is wrong. Here's the problem with what Vivek said on a rational level. Here's why Putin isn't a bully. Here's why all those atrocities that we've seen are fake because he can't prove that. He said that in the past, but it's only ended up embarrassing him. For example, he said that Bucha was done by the Ukrainians. All the evidence since then that has been released. He hasn't changed his position whatsoever, even though it's categorically been proven that the Russians do it. Uh, he can't defend it on the grounds of the argument. So he basically just has to say, oh, well, you sound like a libtard. You sound like that Soros guy, even though Vivek Goswami's main pitch in this campaign is that he doesn't take the same super PAC money that many people on the Republican debate stage do take, and that he doesn't, he, you know, he hasn't been embedded with the deep state, quote unquote. Now, the deep state is kind of a vague word. It's a vague term. Um, I don't really like a lot of how it's been used to just mean anybody who works for the government a lot of times, which I think is unfair to anyone who works in the government definitely being somebody who's from the dmv the maryland virginia area and there's a lot of good uh people who who work to keep the government running every year but it's just guilt by association it's just george soros it's just the deep state it's just the neocons it's it's just insults and and guilt by association let's listen to this interaction though it's it's somewhat interesting I value the fact that Trump prioritized diplomacy and win-win cooperation with China. Uh, you say you want to avoid war with China. The thing about like win-win diplomacy with China, I don't know if the steel sanctions and the aluminum sanctions is win-win diplomacy. Not only because it had a negative effect on American manufacturers who had to use those resources to you know manufacture. Um, and, you know, it didn't really help the American economy whatsoever. Most analysts after the fact have analyzed it as a failure of a trade war, but it also didn't help our relationship with the Chinese. And on the major issues I would want Trump to work with the Chinese on, the major one being climate change, his administration couldn't care less about. Neither does Jackson Hinkle. But on the issues that we would really want Trump or anyone to work with the Chinese on, he doesn't even really care about. So... I don't know. I don't really see Trump as the great diplomat. I think North Korea is a great example. Takes this big gambit, meets him with no preconditions, doesn't only meet him with no preconditions, but stops military readiness drills with the South Koreans to do it. Makes a pitch that's basically, give us all your nukes and we'll put a McDonald's on every street corner. And unsurprisingly, the North Koreans don't take well to that. Uh, they already got their image laundered by, you know, having Donald Trump walk, or, walk around with Kim Jong-un on the border and doing these conferences. Uh, and so they pulled back and they blew up a South Korean liaison office on national TV by the end of Trump's term. It was complete failure. Not to mention Trump is picking people, a lot of which who have no foreign policy experience, trying to manage his foreign policy endeavors, like Jared Kushner, who has then enriched himself with the Saudis after the fact, getting billions of dollars in business deals from the Saudi Foreign Wealth Fund, which only invested in Jared Kushner's business opportunity after the interference 
of the Saudi crown prince, meaning that the Sovereign Wealth Fund saw this Jared Kushner business opportunity, said, eh, probably not a good idea, smart, looking out for its own interests, but then the crown prince interfered in what is very obvious corruption in my mind. So I don't really think, you know, you I, number one, I don't think you can pursue win-win cooperation when you're picking people that are going to engage in, I think, obvious corruption and don't have any foreign policy experience. Not that Vivek Walshwami could at all sympathize with the, the need of foreign policy experience, as we saw on the debate stage. But also, I don't think Donald Trump is serious about working on any of the diplomatic issues with China that are a priority to the United States. Which is, for example, climate change. Over Taiwan, yet in the past, you've made statements like, Taiwan, we're coming for you. The NRA can open up its next branch in Taiwan. Put a, go put a gun in every Taiwanese household. Have them defend themselves. Let's see. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's such a silly. Number one, that's a silly statement. The, chi the Taiwanese are not going to be able to stop the Chinese to stop being the, the central party in uh, on the mainland from taking over the island with a bunch of gun-toting Taiwanese people. Like, that might, you know, help a resistance movement after the fact, but that's not going to be enough to stop the invasion. It could be helpful, maybe a little bit. I'm sure if more Taiwanese people knew how to handle a gun, it would be helpful if there was ever any invasion. But that alone will have no significant impact unless there is direct U.S. support supporting Taiwan. Like, alone, it's not going to be enough to defend the island. It's, I think, mostly virtue signaling on the Second Amendment. See what Xi does then. Uh, given the fact that the United States has U.S. troops training Taiwanese separatists in Taiwan, we've been supplying them with jabs. I like to say Taiwanese separatists, man. Like, at what point is it no longer a separatist? Like, I think, like, eight, like 50, 60, 70 years on, at a certain point, you know, it stops being a separatist and it is just a separate thing, right? Definitely since, you know, when we talk about the Russians it's in Ukraine, he uses a, a, a little bit of a different terminology. You know, it's not, it's not separatists, it's brave patriots fighting for Mother Russia. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I just, just a buzzword, buzzword mania. And your comments such as this and your whole policy of decoupling, how is any of that uh, de-escalatory with China? I think that... It's a philosophy of whether or not you think you're going to get the result you want to by being weak or whether you're actually going to get to peace by being strong. And it is my view, it is my top objective of doing whatever we can that minimizes the risk of war while still deterring China from going. Like, want, can, can we still call American separatists? Are we like the Americans? Like if we how long until calling how long was it until the British stopped calling us the separatists? Like at a certain, like, do they still refer to us as like the, like, if they do, that's silly. But like at a certain point, it's no longer referring to them as a separatist. They're just a separate thing, you know? For Taiwan, for at least as long as we lack semiconductor independence in the United States. And by the way, that might make a lot of people on the pro. This is interesting too, because I actually asked this question publicly before, because Vivek Walshwami seems so ready to, like, drop Ukraine and, like, gut them and hand them over to the Russians in order to try to turn the Russians against the Chinese, which I already think is fantasiful. And it's not only me that thinks that's fantasiful. So I've talked to, like, Rob Noor and other conservatives about this. And under pressure, most will admit, yeah, that's pretty stupid. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't really make logical sense. But my, my question was always, if that's the logic uses in Ukraine, what would stop that logic from also applying to Taiwan? Where it's like, well... We support Taiwan for as long as they have semiconductors that are useful to us. But then once we've built semiconductor independence in the United States, we drop them like a hotcake. Is that what he's about to say? Pro Taiwan camp mad that I added that addendum, but I'm looking at this exclusively through American interests. And so he is. That's what he's saying. His, so his stance is we will support Taiwan as long as we get their semiconductors and they're useful to us. And then we'll drop them like a hotcake. This type of... This type of rhetoric, this type of language is not how you build long-term alliances. And I will also just say that ideology and working with democracies is good. Democracies are more stable. They're usually more economically productive. And I think people like to support others who have similar values to your own. None of these things are, are I think, anything that Vivek Roswami personally cares about. But all, I, all I'm going to put out there is if your only foreign policy belief is, 
I will work with you as long as I can get, you, you know, something out of your country, you know, any historical relationship, any historical alliance or friendship that has been mutually beneficial or security relationship, all of that ends as long as I can get some kind of like short term benefit or like I can, you know, as, 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 as soon as it's somewhat convenient, I'm going to cut the rope. It doesn't look like a, like a reliable ally. For example, if the United States wanted to get some force in the Middle East to work with us on some mission. Why would they do so if they know immediately when they're no longer useful to us, we're going to drop them? That's one of the main critiques of the United States. For example, this is a critique that the Kurds have, that they we supported them. We supported the, the movement in northeastern Syria as long as they were fighting ISIS. And then we're like, OK, we the Turks can do whatever they want. We don't care. We don't stand by our allies. The United States should be a reliable ally and it should be viewed as a reliable, trustworthy partner to work with. This is not how you do it. Definitely after pulling out of the Iran deal, pulling out of Afghanistan, there's so there's been so many things that we've kind of like flip-flopped on on the international stage that has made us look unreliable. If anything, right now, we need to concentrate on making sure that America looks reliable and like a stable ally. The reason Taiwan matters in a way that Ukraine doesn't is that they're responsible for supplying the advanced semiconductor chips that power our modern way of life in the United States. I think it is regrettable that we ever got to a place that our entire economy depends on a tiny island nation off the southeast coast of China, but we are where we are. And so my view is at least until the United States achieves full semiconductor independence, and I think that's, that's where it's not happening tomorrow, but hopefully it can happen in a matter of a few years at earliest. Until then, it's very important that Taiwan stay independent. Can I, can I also just throw out here quickly that the type of logic that he is using right now, the logic that, the, the logic that he is like, like, like accepting, while he's gotten a lot of praise for being very anti-establishment, the reason why Jackson Hinkle is breaking with him is the logic that Vivek Goswami is putting forward is basically the is the logic of like almost like neo-colonial empire. Like we will use you as long as you are useful, then we will dump you, we will trade your land very quickly with other powers. As soon as it suits us, you are merely an actor for which we perform actions for our own imperialist benefit. That's what it sounds like, right? Might might I be uh, you know, exaggerating slightly because I dislike Vivek? Maybe, but I don't think so rather than giving China full economic leverage and more than economic leverage. Not that I necessarily think that's something that, that, that uh, you know, Hinkle cares about. I think his support for Russia shows that. Over the United States. That's why I'm thinking it's differently. I'm an outsider. I'm not a professional politician. So a lot of these ideas are, are different and outside the box ideas. One of them is driving a wedge in the Sino-Russian alliance. Another of them, I believe part of American exceptionalism is exporting some of our greatest inventions, including, for example, why do we have a Second Amendment in this country? It was to deter monarchy, keep monarchy. I'm sorry, this shit's just silly. British monarchy. And uh, the Second Amendment Taiwan stuff is just silly. Bay. So what I said is, I'm not, not talking about going to war with China. I said, just like we have a Second Amendment here, and actually the NRA trained Americans, including black Americans after the Civil War. This is something that really made Don Lemon mad when I pointed out that fact of history to him. But this is a big part of how Americans secured their freedoms. Taiwan, you could do the same thing. Put a gun in every household. Actually, actually other mil folks in the military and who are knowledgeable about having studied the history of this describe it back to me. They said, actually, it's similar to what they describe as the porcupine strategy for Taiwan. I like that analogy. But it's not enough. It's, it's, it would be slightly supplementary at best. It is not a strategy on to, to deter Chinese invasion. It is not a strategy. That will, that will do nothing alone. Take a portfolio of approaches while also securing semiconductor independence for the United States. And the more semiconductor independent the United States is, the I, like you're not going to be able to support Taiwan's defense without spending any money. Like it's like you cannot have your cake and eat it too. That's what it feels like he's tried to do. Less of an incentive China has to actually militarily annex Taiwan. My top objective is to deter Chinese aggression. Yeah, we want to support Taiwan, but spend no money and do nothing to do it. <laughs> but okay, well, sounds like you don't really want to support Taiwan, which he doesn't. He doesn't at all. While avoiding all probability of going to war. And I think the biggest probability of going to war is if China actually does it.
just invade Taiwan, hold our modern way of life hostage, that's actually what would necessarily draw the United States into a prolonged military conflict that's going to be good for no one. I think the way we need to do it is instead be strong by getting in the way of that China, Sino-Russian alliance, by preparing Taiwan to defend itself such that the United States doesn't have to actually enter that conflict and in a way that deters China. Like the Second Amendment thing is just like a, it's just it's just like a red herring. It's just it, it doesn't answer the question really at all. It's, it's just like it's just appealing to his base. Chinese aggression. I don't think by being weak or conciliatory is actually going to do it. I think that's going to achieve the opposite result. And that's why sure, I sure. as U.S. president. I would like like Taiwan. If you if you exclude the mountainous regions of Taiwan, it is the densest country on the planet when it comes to population. How are you going to stop with how are you going to stop the the Chinese Air Force from just trying to level the cities if necessary with like your AR-15? Like you're, there's going to have to be more than just like, you know, pay, like Taiwanese patriots in the mountain ranges, you know, to, to stop a successful invasion. Maybe it would help like a guerrilla movement more afterwards, but I don't know. I think he's, I think he's over. I think he's overestimating how much citizens with guns in their hands can do. It can do a lot. It can help, but it's just supplementary at best. At least in this case. Would ban U.S. companies from doing business in China unless and until the CCP radically reforms those practices. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to ban U.S. companies from doing any business in China until the, U the CCP reforms what practices? Let me hear which, which practices. But I think that's going to achieve the opposite result. And that's why sure, I sure. as U.S. president, I would ban U.S. companies from doing business in China unless and until the CCP radically reforms those practices. And you know what's going to happen? That's a lot harder on China than it is on the United States. And that will it's hard on both of us be, I believe, the basis for the CCP to fold, to say no more intellectual property theft, data theft, using companies as pawns, using dog. He's like, look, we need to, you know, shift the 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 we need to give the Russians Ukraine in order to make them work against the Chinese. Oh, in my grand ploy to, to beat China. OK, what's your plan to beat China? We're just going to say no business. All businesses stop. Oh, so you're going to crash the U.S. economy and then hope Americans are ready for it and hope Americans are going to be willing to do it and that the Chinese will just kind of fold. What if they don't fold? What if they say, fuck you? This is part of our, we will not fold. Then what do you do? Vivek Walshwami? Do you, do you, do you fold? Like, ah, oh, damn, the whole Ukraine gambit didn't work. What are you going to do the head? In conditions to advance geopolitical ends. But that's going to be the standard that I apply as U.S. president is that we're not going to let a geopolitical. Like, like they, they, they didn't really fold when it came to the Trump trade negotiations much on anything. They bought some more agricultural product. That's basically it. Like, why would they like what would be the big th what would even be the big request he would make of them? Like, recognize Taiwan. Like, what would be what would be the ask? Political actor turn our own companies into Trojan horses that undermine the United States from within. That's not the job of a business leader to do. You just said that the one China policy is a phrase that I think you said you don't like. Do you know what the one China policy is and what it specifically says about Beijing governance? Yes, it recognizes that the U.S. does not officially recognize Taiwan as a separate nation from China. It absolutely recognizes that there is a position of strategic ambiguity. That's exactly the grounding. And the Dude, what universe are we in that Vivek Walshwami is explaining foreign, like basic foreign policy details to Jackson Hinkle? Okay, whatever. Okay, sorry. The way it's been described for decades in the United States is a position of strategic ambiguity with respect to Taiwan. But you have leaders in both political parties, including each of the last two presidents, that said that we would militarily defend Taiwan from being physically annexed. So mm -hmm. I, I know that this is, a, this is an issue we could spend a lot of time on. I'm happy to. Taiwan policy is really important to me. But what I'm talking about right now, for the moment, just to keep the discussion focused, and we can go to Taiwan after that, is how China and the Chinese government specifically, the CCP, is using economic incentives to cause companies to behave in ways that expressly undermine American interests in a way that is not 
part of the model of global free market capitalism, yes. but a model of state-directed My question is, well, first of all, I mean, the United States prevents a lot of countries from doing business with us or receiving financial you know, aid from us if they don't agree with our gender policies or our LGBT policies or whatever, but I'm sure you probably wouldn't agree with that. But my question for you is, how does banning corporations from doing business with China coincide with free market ideology or or even help U.S. businesses? Because George Soros says that China... <laughs> but did George Soros... Dude, Soros is king, man. Is Soros the is king. number one threat to open societies. I know you were a Soros fellow for the New America, so I'm just curious about all those links in that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I can address the latter parts of that anytime you want to, but from a biographical perspective, I want to talk to you about the substance of it. I don't think that China is participating in a system of global capitalism. So capitalism is a system in which private parties are free to pursue whatever is in their economic interest. Okay, so he is willing to stop all business trade with China and slam the U.S. economy into the ground in order to battle the Chinese because they're not playing by the rules. But the Russians invade Ukraine and demolish it to the ground, stacking bodies, man, stacking bodies in Izium and Bucha across the board, destroying the grain infrastructure, causing an international crisis when it comes to grain prices, killing who knows how many civilians. Certainly not following the rules. And he's not willing to spend three point, what, I think 0.3% of the GDP to deal with it, 3.5% of our military budget, but it, because that's against America's interest, it doesn't serve America's national security interest, but slamming our economy into the ground to make the, the Chinese communists more capitalist that is within our national security interest, that is within the interest of everyday working people. Okay, okay, whatever. Vivek land, man, we're in Vivek land right now state interference to the minimum, only there to protect private property rights. That's not what exists in China. China is behaving differently because they're expressly preventing companies from entering the Chinese. I mean, I just, I just don't get it. That's, I, we need to stop the Chinese because they're not playing, playing by the rules of the international system, the international economic rules. That's why we need to literally crash our economy, probably costing us trillions upon trillions could put our GDP into negative, could could send us into a recession, possibly. That's within our interests as Americans. But it is not within our interests as Americans to not lose a single American soldier in a war, overseas, supporting an ally, spending 3% of our military budget, having really no or a very small or minimal direct impact on our economy. Okay, Vivek Land. ...these market unless and until they meet non-economic political demands of the CCP. So part of what we're doing is we're operating under an illusion that what we're actually engaged in is free market capitalism from China because that's the narrative we've fed ourselves over the last 50 years when China actually viewed that as a way of undermining the U.S. from within, turning those companies into Trojan horses in ways that China could have never accomplished directly using that's like Greece and Troy in the Trojan War. Tr Greece never believed that it was going to defeat Troy militarily. So they Stop talking about the fuck Trojan War, man. Gave Troy the gift that they knew Troy could not resist, the Trojan Horse. They used that to The Trojan Horse. Sorry, sorry. I couldn't resist the Trojan Horse or the uh oh, yeah. he's, he's 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 making me fuck up my words too. I couldn't resist the Trojan Horse either. Turn Troy down from within. Well, America, China views and Xi Jinping views our description of what we think of as capitalism as the gift we can't resist. But what do they do? They get, they say, Airbnb, you can't enter the Chinese market unless you're actually handing over the user data of individual Americans, by the way, which Airbnb had not told individual Americans at the time that they brokered a separate deal to enter the Chinese market. When when I heard someone say that Vivek kind of goes with the wind, you know, he just kind of he just kind of goes with whatever the voters, the, a certain section of the base of the voters want, and he's just going to go with it. 
whatever he's he's somebody said that some people have a product and they look for a market vivek looked at the market and then made himself he made the product and that's what he's done over the last year on the campaign trail and he's even admitted a few on a few podcasts he's kind of learned a lot of this as he goes and i think this is a good example of it because i really think if you've sat down and you workshop this it'd be very hard to balance his position on ukraine from his position on china and, exp and explain, you know, there's not really a Sino-Soviet split to go through. It really just feels like he's saying whatever he thinks is going to get him a good reaction in the market. That is, you know, within a section of the Republican base, a popular section of the base. They told BlackRock, effectively, so you can't enter the Chinese market unless you lobby for different standards for Chinese companies to list in the United States, which Larry Fink dutifully did. Only after that, certainly on the facts of it, the sequence of events was it was only after that that China granted them the license to send those, sell those mutual funds in China. Even Elon Musk, it was days after, literally days after Elon Musk tweeted and commented about Taiwan peacefully annexing with China that they got a special tax exemption in Shanghai. Again, a nice little attaboy on the back. And so I think it is, it is at least an interesting irony where wherever you are in the debate about policy, it's interesting that the world's biggest self-professed champion of free speech is kissing the ring and bowing at the feet of the world's biggest censor of speech. It's just an- Did he just call Elon a bitch for Beijing? I think he did. Moral, I, think he, I think he really did. Man. Mr. Delight, thank you for the tier one being set for 12 months, a whole year. Guys talked politics at too many swanky cocktail parties. Bro. Actually, no, too many podcasts, in my opinion. An interesting phenomenon to make, to observe and ask what's going on there. And part of what's going on there is a government that is tilting the scales. Hmm. Well, that's enough of that. I don't want to look at either of these guys anymore. Goobers.